She's scrambling, my dears. Scrambling, scrambling. It's painful to watch, isn't it? Because we tried to warn them both. We tried to. It's very, very sad. You know, one minute you're the most influential woman in the world. Next minute you're scrambled Megs on toast. And it's not a very appetizing meal, my dear. You're going to see a lot of scrambling. And, you know, another span is in the work now. Because she's doing what she should have done from the moment she left. This is what she should have done when they left the royal family. She should have seen what she is, which is an overinflated influencer who got lucky. I don't care what you say. She does have potential as a brand, although she's sullied uh, a lot of that. But she should have invested all her efforts into the TIG back when she left the royal family. Speculation intensified last September when Mejan applied to reactivate the TIG trademark and retain its domain name. Oh dear, what a shame. It's been claimed by Richard Eden that that trademark application has been delayed by a further six months because she forgot to sign the application. So heads might be rolling within her legal team because that was a very careless oversight, wasn't it? If true, if it's true. She didn't sign it, so apparently she's been told, no, you'll have to wait another six months to reapply again. The US Patent and Trademark Office also told her that her original description of her website was too broad. She needs to be more specific about what it's going to provide. And I should imagine this is quite a setback for her plans. She should have relaunched that site from the word go. And it, actually, if I, if I was in her position, I would probably rename it and relaunch it under a different name to get it going right now because time is of the essence and her value as an influencer is rapidly diminishing. She's got to start convincing the big bucksers, the Netflixers and the Spotifyers and all these grand investors that she's worth the big bucks that they're reported to be blowing on them. And as she's beginning to discover the wider world, whether rightly or wrongly, because I do believe, unlike some of you, I do believe that she does have genuine passions for many of those worthy efforts, I, I do, but the wider world ain't gonna take them seriously when it comes to that kind of thing, when it comes to her political ambitions. They just don't. Now, where she can seriously deliver is everything that comes under the TIG, fashion, well-being, travel, holidays. There is a market and an audience for the things that she loves, you know, Megan's loves and what she's wearing, this, that, and the fourth. There truly is. And that is where her bread is buttered, along with her connection to royalty, of course, because that's the thing that elevates the TIG out of the dump. Royalty is the platform that elevates all of her mediocre offerings into something more spectacular. I don't know much about the TIG. I know she had some moderate success with it. From what I see, it seems to be a collection of conceited photographs of everything wonderful that's going on with her life. But you know, I'm never going to come down like a ton of bricks on someone with an entrepreneurial spirit, uh, someone who wants to make the most of their platform. So, you know, good honour. The one thing I will resent her for, you know, I was looking at some of the old posts she made on it this morning. She talks about peonies. Do you know, I always mistakenly pronounced peonies as peonies. It was only a few years ago I discovered that I was getting it wrong. So that was a bit of a faux pas. But I... I prefer my pronunciation, don't you, dears? The peonies. So now whenever I call them peonies, it sounds vulgar in my head. I can't get rid of it, but peonies they are. And she was talking about her peonies, which just happens to coincide with the first time I brought some peonies into the show, which I was showing you the other day, and the, the petals have begun dropping, I'm afraid, piling up. But uh, just as I was getting acquainted with the peonies, she had to go and spoil it for me. But she said in one of her posts, always buy yourself flowers especially peonies. Invaluable life-enhancing advice there from the Tig. Apparently the Tig was named after her favourite red wine, Tiganello. I haven't got bundles and bundles of royal stuff to discuss with you today, my dear, so it's just a chin mag, and much of this video will be a tip jar corner because I haven't done one of those for a while and some of you have been asking. So uh, I will be doing one of those, showing you my charity shop finds, which is quite timely because uh, a member of the royal family has been bargain hunting uh, around the charity shops, which is our version of Goodwill, I suppose you could say, where the money for second-hand goods goes to charity, various charities, and that's our queen-in-waiting, Camilla. And I thought it was very timely because she confessed yesterday to having a large collection of royal memorabilia that she picks up second-hand from these kind of shops. 
and those of you in the United Kingdom will be very familiar with some of the charity shops we have. There are a huge amount of really rather kitsch memorabilia, lots of mugs, and it's very tiny because I picked up one yesterday. This cup in a beautiful brown, just with the ER for Elizabeth Regina. I love the shape, I love the gold lettering and the crown, it's in perfect condition. It was six or seven quid and I thought it made a nice change from the, the, the normal ones where you have pictures and faces of the royal family and the royal weddings. And it is tempting to pick up, there were so many of them that, that I saw yesterday, but including some Harry and Meghan cups and old memorabilia that no one wants anymore. <laughs> so I just pumped for this one, but the cup that Camilla had found was a bargain £1.50 cup from the Silver Jubilee in 1977. She was visiting a social enterprise community that she's patron of, which supports homeless people through education, training and personal development. And she said, I see you've got a nice Jubilee bug. I go to buy that. I have a whole collection, believe it or not. She said the charity shop was a great place to get presents if you had the time and that there were plenty of bargains to be found. And that's what I love about them. She also shook hands with Padmini, a giant puppet made by Global Grooves who are going to be producing lots of these larger than life puppets for the Jubilee celebrations. So really rather vulgar photographs of Haribold emerged at the weekend while he was playing this friendly polo match. Did you see? I, I barely dare put them on display for you, dear, because I didn't want that imagery in my mind. It put me right off my marmalade on toast this morning, I can tell you, dears. I mean, we're not talking Jilly Cooper, are we, with these, my dears? It's not the sexy, fantastic world of handsome men that make husbands jealous. This is Harry we're talking about, Harry and old Meji. Not quite the same, not royal. Just a bunch of clowns. But they're in Santa Barbara at the Polo and Racket Club. Not a care in the world, it seems, not a care in the world, having a time of their life. Meji spent time with her bestie, Marcus Anderson, of Soho House. And this famous polo player was with them. What's his name? Nachos and Cheese. No, Nacho Figueras, forgive the pronunciation, dear, but he is the uh, a famous international polo player and some kind of model. And she was photographed in black summer shorts, a relaxed white blazer and Chanel flats. And I've got to tell you, that's one of my favourite looks for her from what I can see from these photographs. Uh, she's one of the few women, if not the only one, that I prefer in flats. I think that might do more for her than stilettos or heels, perhaps. But I can't think of a single time I would ever suggest that a woman wears flats over heels, because that's just the aesthetic that I enjoy. But in Mejan's case, possibly. What do you think of the green chiffon today, together with the brooch, my dears? You know, I, I did tell you once or twice that I hate bows on anything. Had no desire to wear one. But what can I tell you? I tried a bow with this this morning and I thought, oh, that actually works quite nicely. So I've put my prejudice aside for one day. Tina Brown must be rolling in clover because her book, The Palace Papers, has been getting so much publicity the past few weeks. She must be in clover, my dears. Everybody's taking it very seriously. I take everything with a pinch of salt, but she does say that some of her whispers emanated from a former palace employee. And this story in particular has been hitting the headlines. So brace yourselves, especially my dear fruities in Australia, because it appears that Mejan hated every moment that they were on tour in your fair country. To give Mejan the benefit of the doubt, I'm pretty sure that actually she didn't hate every moment of being there. I'm sure it was joy fill filled. But what I can believe is that she began to start resenting certain elements of royal hierarchy. Oh dear, I can picture it now. She's got to relaunch the TIG under the new name, Hierarchy, isn't she? Welcome to Hierarchy, where everyone can be a princess just like me, a true princess. Tina's sources say that Meghan simply didn't get it. She found the tour pointless. She didn't understand why things are set up in that way. And instead of being excited, when thousands of people turned up at the Opera House, it was very much like, what's the purpose? I don't understand this. She didn't appear to grasp the representational role of the monarchy. She was more interested in causes that she wanted to spotlight. The Times reported last year that she'd said, 
what are they all doing here? It's silly. And on one hand, I'm sure she was saying that, if true, to be self-effacing, you know, why have they turned out for little me? You know, it's silly and it's just royalty and this is Australia. What do they care about the Queen of England, who is actually the Queen of Australia? But why couldn't she grasp it? You know, royalty has a magical effect, similar to the magic of celebrity, which is fading and fading now. It's not like the golden stars of yesteryear and the magic that they spun. But royalty has always been on a much more elevated level. The magic has been truly unmatched, unsurpassed. But you'd think that she could understand it because it's no more silly than her little pocket of fans running along to the TIG and all those years are going, oh, what's Megan buying? What's Megan eating? Where's Megan staying? We want some of that. Oh, Megan loves peonies. Let's buy peonies. I mean, that's obviously on a minute little scale, but you'd think that she could understand the effect of influence. And this is where Harry really let her down and let the monarchy down because he didn't steer her and explain to her the relevance of the symbolism of royals to monarchy and to the nation. Apparently this jolly to Australia was a huge turning point because this is when they began mistaking the force of their powers and where they started warping and twisting the adulation that was coming towards them. And we got snippets of this in the Oprah interview because they referred to it as a point, I can't remember the exact wording, but seemed to insinuate this is where jealousies began within the palace. A lot of people have taken that to mean that Catherine and William were jealous of the success of that Australia tour. Tina's book claims that they took away a feeling of unrecognised importance in the hierarchy of the royal family. It seems that she was overwhelmed by the adulation that's heaped on royalty, but she failed to understand that it wasn't about them as individuals. The adulation is bestowed on them because of their royal connection, but they interpreted their success as a call for Brand Sussex to be elevated. And it's reported that they felt snubbed when they returned to Blighty and weren't hugely praised by the royal family or weren't actively raised up in the hierarchy. Apparently this is where Megan got a real fire under her belly and began thinking, wow, this brand really is so powerful. I mean, I've seen it in England. I saw it at the wedding, the lining the streets of Windsor these for their spectacle. You know, these plebs all lined up for us, don't know why. But even on the other side of the world, she's Queen of Australia? What? Well, that must mean I'm Princess of Australia. Oh, you know, the power. We have so much power here, Harry, and we need to, you know, focus it into our loves and our passions because what can the royals do? Why? It's so silly. Why are they making such a fuss of royalty? Now, my hunch is that during this tour, this is the time when Meghan began to see this isn't how things usually go. Usually she does the entrepreneurship. She does the hustling and bustling. And the end result is the spotlight shines on her. Now, even though in Australia the spotlight was very much on Harry and Meghan and they enjoyed such positive, amazing coverage from the press, you know, everyone loved them, almost everyone, uh, you know, they were getting all that, but the buck didn't stop with them. This is the thing. I think this is what got to them. They realised that all the goodwill, all the adulation, all the great praise didn't stop with them. They were elevating up the royal family. You know, their efforts at the end of the day weren't resulting in a large check going into their bank balance. They were there to lift up the royal family, the monarchy, Kate and William and the Queen, the crown, let's face it. The more their success was growing, the more it dawned on them that that success was just a player in the game, that they were just there really to contribute to the main event, which is the crown. And they didn't like that. Whereas most of us who understand and respect the tradition of royalty and understand that it's a team effort that requires a lifetime of service, duty, holding back, biting your tongue, playing your part, not merching. You know, most of us understand that they didn't. And even if Mejan had her excuses for not understanding the cultural differences, being American opposed to English, Harry did and should of him have imparted this to Mejan before the marriage was underway. But of course, it seems that they both have very destructive inclinations. And I don't think either of them were really too concerned about carving out a smooth journey. They wanted an excuse to be havoc wreakers. Now it's time for me to show and tell a few trinkets from the charity shops for you. Welcome to Tip Jar Corner. <laughs> 
Susan Blake, thank you for the tip you sent me for Cinco de Mayo. It was most kind. I'm just mentioning you because I did email you some thanks, but your email address has always bounced, the one associated with your PayPal account. That does happen a few times with some of you, I'm afraid, so uh, don't think that I ignored your kindness. Uh, this was one of my favourite finds. It's a very simple but a very shimmery jacket in gold sequins and it's an original from the 70s. It was by, made by Gina Bacconi. So I will enjoy breathing some new life into that in one of my shows. I don't want to show you too much. I did pick up a few garments uh, this week but I don't really want to show them to you because it spoils the surprise of what I, what I uh, come to you with. The gold always works very well, it's very royal, and I want to breathe some new life into this. I like imagining some disco dolly in the 70s heading down to Studio 54 or dancing to the Nolans, something like that, and uh, it's going to be loved by me now for a little while at least. And this brooch as well was a lovely find. I've been looking for another green one. And I love the different array here of the various stones. All those different shapes and sizes. I think it's very regal and all the different shades of green. It's gorgeous on that gold backing. I wore this one in a recent video and I was pleased with that find. I've been looking out for some larger brooches and I thought this one was very royal, uh, although it's rather dark and smoky with its grey. I thought it had a lovely antique look to it. Uh, lovely fats, facets there in the large stone and some nice movement on that drop at the bottom. I try to hold back on earrings but occasionally I do get tempted especially when there's something dramatic to report to you my dears but I did rather like these ones because they're purple. Unfortunately you can't see very well in this camera but the stones in this crown aren't black they are purple like amethysts and these match uh, exactly the, the same purple. Very classic look there with the cluster of diamonds forming a, a diamond shape there at the top and those lovely tears of amethyst at the bottom. Beautiful, so royal. This one's not the most beautiful shape in the world, but sometimes a really simple brooch uh, with a large stone uh, is what's warranted and what's needed. And I like the fire in that orange stone, isn't it nice? And on the surround, it looks a bit like carrots actually. I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but you have these green and orange elements. On, a, on sort of four corners, and they're engravings of leaves there in silver. These were quite unusual. Little angel wings that clasp to the ears and sort of go up the side there with yellow orange stones. And golden wings, I'm sure sometimes you'll have seen in my videos some framed angel wings in the background in a gold frame. So I thought these would match quite well with those. And I rather like the triangular shape of the stones there, like little petals for the ears. I was very pleased to find this brooch because of the colour of it. It's a really lovely lilac, pastel lilac there, uh, with beautiful baubles in the middle, all pearlized. And I'm excited about it because I found a really stunning sort of lace lilac bolero that I'll probably wear this week because I love it. It was a really good find. And this matches really, really well with it. And I love the pinky, pinky little gemstones that go around in swirls all around the side. And it is a flower design, but it's not too over floral. And I like the size of it. So that was one of my favourite finds of recent times. I also found a rather antique looking white top, which has various gauzy panels on it. You'll see it in an upcoming video. Although at the moment you can see my little sugar ice buns, my nip nips uh, through one of the gauzy pieces. It's a little bit obscene. I have to see what I can do about that. But this might go well with that or another of the white numbers. Pearl. No, Megan, you can't have my pearl. I like the simplicity of this pearly halo. All the pearls clustered there. And it's mixed in with these little lucite beads. And they have that aurora borealis charm to them where they shine iridescent multifaceted colors like the wings of a dragonfly so i love the way that it pairs with the pearls there and they seem to complement each other very well and i'll enjoy wearing that we have a bold and vibrant blue butterfly here isn't that lovely almost peacocky in its delicious bold colours and again this has iridescent stones on it as well that give a different flavour. I love there at the base of the wing you see those large shards of lapis lazuli colour. Various blues from cornflower to turquoise, cobalt. 
I also found this little fabric neck piece. I'm not sure when I'll be inspired to wear such a thing, but it might come in handy because I, I rather like the sort of jet button that it has on the front of it, this jet jewel, and it's surrounded by this sort of antique looking floral arrangement. I don't think I've shown you this ring, but yes, another ring for the collection. And this one is a sort of yellowy gold, very faceted there on a round podium with trillions of sparkles. I got excited when I saw this book because I hadn't heard of it before. The Queen Elizabeth Family by Enid Blyton. I thought it might be about the Queen, but no, it's actually about a ship. I read a lot of Enid Blyton books growing up. They're amongst my very favourites. I think my favourite childhood book of all time was The Enchanted Forest and The Folk of the Faraway Tree by Enid Blyton. Such a treat for the imagination. I get so upset when I see the modern renditions that are put out there because apparently, you know, I think the names of the children weren't they were Dick and Fanny and Bears had all these sort of mischievous names that had uh, double meanings, should we say, and they've changed them now to all kinds of vul vulgar modern names. It's so unsophisticated, it really is. It made everything politically correct. Well, uh, I enjoyed the, the old school adventures of Silky and Moonface and uh, what was it, Mr. Saucepan, Mr. Saucepan Face Man. And the famous five, of course, are wonderful, but I hadn't heard of this one. To travel on the Queen Elizabeth is a great adventure and to see New York as another. And they both happened to Mike, Belinda and Anne. For Daddy went to America and took them with him. <laughs> Just like Harry. This has the name of Margaret in it as well. Margaret Rose. And that was published in 1951, a couple of years before the Queen's coronation. And look what I found, this book by Richard Dimbleby, Elizabeth, our Queen. A new era for Britain opened in February 1952 when the second Elizabeth came to the throne. No more devoted or courageous person than she could carry on the monarchy, which is the enduring strength of Britain and the wonder and envy of a large part of the world. And isn't it amazing to think that those words were written, this is 1953, so seven, 69, 70 years ago. Isn't it absolutely incredible that she's still there? But I was really happy to find this book because a lot of them seem sort of celebratory but not that insightful, whereas this has got some really good chapters on the function of royalty, the training for the throne, the mantle of monarchy, birthright, and the rights of the sovereign. So it'll be rather educational for me and it's also got some really nice pictures in it as well, and photos. I'll read the last paragraph to you. I don't think I'm giving away any spoilers, dear, but I'll read the last paragraph. Our ancient monarchy renders inestimable services to our country and to all the British Empire and the Commonwealth of Nations, declared Mr. Churchill in the House of Commons in November 1948. Above the ebb and flow of party strife, the rise and fall of ministries and individuals, the change of public opinion or of public fortune, the British monarchy presides ancient calm and supreme within its functions over all the treasures that have been saved from the past and all the glories we write in the annals of our country. Those glories cannot be written, it is obvious, by Queen Elizabeth alone. Kings cannot reign unless their subjects give, wrote Dryden, and as Princess Elizabeth, the Queen made it clear that her 21st birthday vow of dedication to the service of ourselves and the great imperial family to which we all belong, was possible only if the people themselves shared in it. Her throne must find its foundation in the hearts of subjects if the burden of monarchy is to be made bearable for her, and her functions as sovereign are to have a real and practical value. Her court be pure, her life serene, God give her peace, her land repose. A thousand claims to reverence close in her as mother, wife and queen. So let it be. Well, I'm not sure if you could say her life's been serene exactly, but she has had a very happy life, I do believe, with much joy. So there is good cause to be jubilant for the upcoming Platinum Jubilee. 70 years since this ancient tome was written. 70 years! And it's funny, I get such whiffs of nostalgia and pangs for old blighty, the England of old, and the sort of more deferential society we have when I read this kind of thing. For those who have asked, yes, I will be celebrating the Jubilee. Uh, I'm going to a private dinner at one point, which is very exciting. 
but for the rest of it, I'll be popping into more sort of locally villagey kind of functions. And uh, some of my family are actually hosting a street party because we're going to be having street parties up and down the country. So I will probably be heading out to the sticks to see one branch of that family and celebrate with them. I haven't quite decided yet, but yes, I will be making celebrations. And this also filled me with nostalgia. I found this uh, together with the book, actually. It's Celebrations from the Coronation. And this comes from a place called Woking, which is sort of, I've never been to Woking, but it's kind of on the outskirts of London, a few miles out on the, in the commuter belt. It's not a particularly glamorous place, I don't think. But it's a programme of celebrations that was arranged by the Woking Urban District Council to commemorate the coronation of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, 2nd of June 1953. And it's just absolutely darling because it's just full of all their arrangements for community singing, the variety and talent shows that are going on, cricket pavilion, open air dancing on the upper lawn, all these huge uh, grand coronation fireworks displays, the discharge of rockets, the salvos of silver saucisson, discharge of the dizzle dazzle rockets, the emerald illumination, display of amber and turquoise shells, the falls of Zambezi, <laughs> display of parachute rockets. Can you believe this? It's just fantastic. The oriental jeweled tree, emerald electrites, the sunset illumination, discharge of golden rockets, the jeweled spreader. That sounds interesting, doesn't it? Swarm of fireflies, an aerial bank of violets. That is just heaven. That is heavenly eye candy to my eyes. The fact they've gone out of their way to describe each firework like that. Competitions, window dressing and window spotting, a balloon race. This is just so quintessentially English, I cannot tell you. I can smell the freshly mown grass on the fields and meadows. I can see the bunting and the gentle breeze flapping. The council are presenting souvenir mugs to all children of school age attending private and maintained schools in the district. Grand fancy dress parade. I would love to see the photographs of that. Living chess. Oh, for a time machine, my dears. Wouldn't you love to go back and drink it all in? I know that I have rather rose-coloured glasses for the past. Not everything was hunky-dory, but part of my soul absolutely yearns for that era before social media and the internet and all that kind of vulgarity. But then I suppose, on the flip side, Without that, I wouldn't be able to broadcast to you guys, would I? We'd be strangers, and you'd be in your towns and villages and continents going about your daily lives, and we wouldn't be able to have our little chinwags, would we, my dear fruits? So you got to do a Prince Philip and be more outward and upward-looking, haven't I? You know? And uh, be optimistic in life, and I do believe that that is a much more royal way to be, and so uh, one mustn't get too mired in uh, days gone by and thoughts of the past, because they are gone. And thankfully, even in 2022, we still have our gracious majesty with us, the regal queen, Elizabeth. And as for Harry and Meghan, well, in 70 years from now, she'll be pushing 120 years old, something along those lines. So. I wonder if she'll be remembered in quite the same way and with quite the same amount of affection. And Harry, will he be Harry the hero or Harry the traitor? I guess that's for the history books. And we don't know who's going to be cooking them, do we, my dears? But we're here and now. We know what's going on and we can see it for what it is. So We'll take comfort in each other and in our trinkets. And with that said, thank you so much for everyone who sent me a uh, tip for the tip jar because I do put them towards my own personal funds for the trinkets that I try to share with you and decorate the scenery and the set with. So it's truly very much appreciated. Thank you for sharing your time with me and I will see you in the next broadcast. Take care my fruits. Stay royal.